Hi and welcome to this course. I am so excited to bring you this overview course in Scala language. This course might be of real value for a lot of people because you know right, because of growing industry needs and demands, we need to scale our applications up to get along. And as we are going towards achieving scalability in our applications, such languages are here with us to make things easier. It makes it easy to write code more concisely, provides independency for us, the developers, to make our own rules and constructs while writing applications. So if you're asking me what should you already know to take this course, I'll assure you that there are no prerequisites. But as you know, it's always an added advantage if you know basics about programming. If you are going to get started with Scala in your very next project, then this course is for you. Next comes, what is our expectations with this course? See, our goal with this course is to make you guys know about what is a programming paradigm and to add a skill set of course, Scala, to know its history and how it became a popular language, how we can achieve scalability using this language, how it is scalable I mean to say, and of course, to write Scala applications, because that's what we are here for, okay? So, let's talk about course introduction. Our objective with this course is to make you understand basic concepts of Scala language and to be able to write Scala applications. We have divided this course into six modules. With each module, we will go further and get comfortable with our understanding of Scala language. First, we will start with programming paradigms. We will learn functional programming paradigm. If you haven't heard of this, sit back and relax. We will discuss shortly. After programming paradigms, we will go on and start a tour of Scala. Then we will go on and learn about collections. You know, Scala has slightly different collections, which primarily supports immutable data structures. Then we will learn about functional programming, how we can implement functional programming using Scala. Afterwards, subject oriented programming concepts using Scala like classes, objects, traits, etc. Because you know, Scala makes sure that you get the best of both worlds. Scala is object oriented as well as functional. So we will learn about how we can achieve Scala's functional and object oriented capabilities. Then we'll uh, finally dive into some advanced concepts about Scala language, such as the exception handling, pattern matching, and how to apply each of these. So put your seat belts on. We are gonna launch our gears and get started. So put your seat belts on and we are gonna launch our gears and get started. All the best in advance, because you know, you're gonna scale up your knowledge base now, okay? Let's start with our first module, that is functional programming. We will be focusing on three major topics for this lecture. Understanding functional programming, why is it so important and able to make presence in modern software architecture, Finally, differences between functional and object-oriented programming. We will start by discussing what is a paradigm. A simple definition states that a paradigm is a pattern of something. And when we say programming paradigm, we mean a pattern of writing programs. The concept of functional programming is old. It is indeed older than you. Lisp was the first functional programming language introduced in the late 50s, 1958. What is the main idea of being functional? See, if we sit around the table and discuss about that, we will come up with this argument that functions are first class citizens. And what do we mean by that? By first class citizen, we mean a function can give meaning to whatever we write, be it an abstraction or some logic to implement. A function can accept another function as a parameter. We can send functions as arguments, we can nest them and be patient. We will take a look at that when we'll do hands-on later in this course. Second idea is functional programming strongly supports immutability. You know what is it? Our friend Wikipedia says an immutable object is an object whose state cannot be modified after it's created. And do remember this property because later in this course we will relate scalability and immutable objects. And that's why I'll expect you to remember this. So let's repeat this one more time. An immutable object is an object whose state cannot be modified after it's created. Great. Another important concept of this pattern of programming is referential transparency. 
Referential transparency means that functions that you write should expect some arguments and return results after some computation or some logic without affecting other parts of our program, such as state of a variable, etc. Let's understand this with this uh, simple example. Suppose you have this function, def, add us together. It's a Scala way of writing a function. We use def keyword to define a function, then function name, arguments list, and return type. In our case, we are taking two arguments, a and b. Those are of integer type, and it's returning an integer. This function is as simple as possible. It performs an add operation and returns back the result. If you look closely, this function does not affect any other parts of the program and supports this major concept of functional programming called referential transparency. Let's define this. Referential transparency is a characteristic of a function which states that for a particular input, an invocation of a referentially transparent function can be replaced by its result without changing the program semantics. Let's understand with this example. We will use our add function that we defined earlier. We wrote val well expected 5 as you can assume that we are going to have 5 after adding 2 and 3. We are calling this add us together function with 2 and 3 parameters. It can be written as val well expected 5 is equal to 5 without affecting other parts of the program semantically. So I suppose you understood and if you support functional programming as I do, you would also support immutable data structures, referentially transparent methods. Okay, so let's comment that we are eager and we will look for functional alternatives of imperative constructs. Now, you may ask me why functional programming? Maybe you just want to start programming and want to know why functional programming? Or you would say that I'm so used to and so much into imperative style of programming. Why would I choose to go with functional programming anyway? I'll pause for a moment. Then my response will be, you know, remember we talked about immutable objects. Let's relate that to scalability. As our industry is growing up so drastically, small industries grew bigger. Their systems are thriving for scalability. Applications used by those industries need to be flexible with demands. They should be able to scale up or scale down in time. Scalability is an attribute, meaning to be able to scale up or down in size. Means, we need to write concurrent programs that can explicitly execute multiple threads and perform multiple tasks without affecting the overall program semantics. This was hard. Managing threads was a cumbersome task and required a lot of hard work. And if you change states of any variable in multiple threaded application, then you are done. This is one of the prime reasons of using functional programming. It supports immutability and hence make things easier. Immutable objects once defined cannot be changed. As we will learn more and more about this way of programming, you will see it's pretty concise. It's pretty and it's concise. And we can achieve more by writing less code. And who wants to write more code and get the same results anyway? It cuts down overall time required to produce a scalable and nicely written application. Okay, sounds good, isn't it? I suppose you now have some understanding of function programming. And now we'll talk about our last topic for this lecture, that how it is different from object-oriented world. Object-oriented programming provides us a nice way to construct our abstractions, provide us encapsulation in forms of classes, repeat these constructs, get copies of them, call them objects, and use them with some logic and get things done. That's how we do it in object-oriented world. But in process of this, we play with one sweet little thing called state, which is beautiful to play with if a program is not dealing with more threads. You know, you don't want complexity of managing states at all. Because there is functional programming, which provides us functions, immutable objects, referential transparency, and, and so much. So why bother? But wait, there are good things about object-oriented programming. And guess what? Scala supports them. Yeah, you're right. Scala is functional as well as object-oriented in nature. So guys, that's it for this lecture. We will summarize what we have learned. We started with functional programming. What is functional programming? We got the idea about when it all started. 
What's the main idea about function programming? We talked about functions as first class citizens, referential transparency. We learned about why we would choose functional programming. We related immutability and scalability. Then we learned about functional programming versus object oriented programming. How states can introduce complexities and all. So I hope you enjoyed this lecture and the time spent with us was great and worth. See you until the next lecture and happy learning guys.